Hey, Browns fans, before we get started, just want to thank the sponsors of today's show. Head to omahasteaks.com slash dogs, D-A-W-G-S right now and use promo code dogs when you check out. Take advantage of the 50% off site-wide sale, plus you'll get eight free burgers with your order. And again, use that code dogs when you check out to get $30 off your order. And Danger Coffee. Get 10% off at dangercoffee.com slash dogs. Use promo code dogs. 10% off mold-free, toxin-free, delicious coffee. Welcome to the Dogs Podcast with your hosts, Blake Reniker, Justin Charles, and Josh All. What's up, Browns fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Dogs Podcast presented by Omaha Steaks. Josh all alone with you on the episode today, continuing our journey through the state of the Browns. Positional breakdown, and we are going into the wide receiver position today. And if you're watching this on YouTube, first of all, like and subscribe. We appreciate that very much. But if you're watching the video, uh, this is what I call a genuine missed opportunity. So I did the running backs, State of the Browns episode previously, and for whatever reason, did not even think to throw on one of my Nick Chubb Browns jerseys for that episode, which, wow, you got to, I mean, holy crap, Josh, that's big old, big old missed opportunity right there. And uh, so I figure I'll just, I'll just throw it on today for the wide receiver show. And we'll talk about wide receivers while I'm wearing my Nick Chubb jersey in hopes that the Browns and Nick Chubb's team can work out some sort of situational deal where, you know, he's, he's going to take a pay cut and stay with the team. But that was all discussed in the previous episode. We've got all offseason to talk about what the Browns are doing in that regard. Today is all about wide receivers. So like the video, subscribe to the channel, like my jersey, subscribe to Nick Chubb. And here we go talking about the wide receivers for the Cleveland Browns in 2024. Before we dive in, and honestly, this is the sad part about this episode, this show, this specific position group. We really only have two guys to talk about, and that sucks when you're talking about the NFL. The modern the modern day NFL is past, baby. It is past, happy, past friendly. Elite quarterbacks run the league. Elite wide receivers run the league. And the Browns have two guys under contract that are even worth talking about really right now, man, that's not good. That's not good. And a key note that I want to talk about for pass catchers in general, just wide receivers, and we'll do tight ends on the next one. But what I really want to acknowledge here, currently in the NFL, this is the trend, okay? NFL defenses on average across the entire league, not just some teams, this one, or the entire league. NFL defenses are running zone coverage on an average of 70% 70 of the time. So they're running man on defense just 30% of the time. So when we look at wide receivers, whether we're diving into free agents here coming up that we want to talk about, or specifically the NFL draft prospects when we're talking about guys coming into the league, what do we like to see from these guys? How do you perform against zone coverage? Because if you can consistently... And this primarily goes to the college guys, but if you can consistently get open against zone coverage in college, there's a good chance that's going to translate to the NFL. Whereas if you're not very good at getting open and and creating separation against zone in college, you're not going to be able to do it in the NFL. The talent, the talent increase on defense in the NFL from college to pro is, is so, is just so vast. It's just such a big jump from college to the NFL. If you can't do it in college, you ain't going to do it in the NFL. It's just not going to happen. So, we are going to be looking at some of our receivers here and how they broke down versus man versus zone and that kind of thing too. So we just just keep that number in mind, 70% zone coverage in the modern day NFL. So with that being said, let's start things off with an awesome player, an awesome dude, an awesome Cleveland Brown, Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper is six foot one, 210 pounds. He is 29 years old and he's going to turn 30 in June. So he will be, this is his age 30 NFL season. He was born in Miami, Florida, played college football at Alabama. He won the Bolitnikoff Award in 2014 for the best wide receiver in the nation. Selected fourth overall in the first round by the Oakland Raiders. They were Oakland back then in 2015. A couple years later, in 2018, the Dallas Cowboys traded a first-round pick to the Raiders 
in exchange for Amari Cooper. Played a few seasons there in Dallas and was really good. He was really good in Oakland too. And then in 2022, the one we all love to talk about and point to all the time. Cleveland Browns magician, general manager, Andrew Barry trades a fifth round pick and a sixth round pick swap with the Dallas Cowboys in exchange for Amari freaking Cooper. In 2022, the first season in Cleveland, Amari Cooper played in all 17 games, 132 targets, 78 receptions, 1,160 yards, and nine touchdowns. Nine touchdowns were his career high, and the 1,160 yards in his first season with the Browns was the second highest single season yardage output of his career to that point. So, for the Dallas Cowboys, I, I get what they were trying to do. They wanted to get his cap hit off of the team. I understand. They had CeeDee Lamb, a guy they drafted in the first round that they said, this is going to be our wide receiver of the future. We need to pay him big money next. I get it. But for the Browns to be able to get a legitimate wide receiver one, an alpha wide receiver one for a fifth round pick, whoo, buddy, Andrew Barry. What an awesome move that was. And then he comes to Cleveland and has one of the best seasons of his whole career. I mean, he's he's been in the league for a long time. Mark Cooper came in. He might have been 20, maybe 21 years old when he came in the league. I should look that up. I know he was super young when he came in and he's been around for a long time, which is why he's had such an extensive career already and he's not yet 30. So for him to have one of his career best seasons in Cleveland on the first time he came and he's playing with Jacoby Brissett and a... I know I hate the word rusty, but you know, when Deshaun Watson came back, it was 700 days since he'd played meaningful football at the NFL level. And for Amari Cooper to still put up that kind of season is something really, really special. So kick things into 2023. Amari Cooper played in 15 games. He missed the last two games against the Jets. He sustained that heel injury in his week, uh, the week before in the blow up game in Houston. And then of course he didn't play against the Bengals. So Amari Cooper in 2023, 128 targets, 72 receptions, 1,250 yards, five touchdowns. Now, 2023 was Amari Cooper's career high in receiving yardage. Think about that. So in his first two seasons in Cleveland, he now has his number one overall receiving season and his number three overall receiving season in his entire career, just in the last two years. So Amari Cooper, you know, for... Anybody who may have a misconception that, oh, he's getting older, maybe he's not producing at the same level as he did when he was younger, he's having career seasons right now. Like, we are in that moment, and it's so much fun to watch. So those 1,250 yards this year, that was the 10th most in the NFL. So we had a top 10 receiving or receiver on the Cleveland Browns, despite going through four different quarterbacks with him. He had 277 yards after the catch. Now get this, he had 1,820 air yards. Seventh most in the entire NFL. He had 29 deep targets. That was the sixth most. You know, we talk about Amari Cooper as like this route running technician, a very good, sure-handed, reliable possession receiver, but he had the sixth most deep targets in the league. So the Browns are not afraid to send him on go routes and go deep to him, and he's successful in doing so. He had a 2.31 yards per route run, number 14 overall in the league. That's That number, just to give you guys some example, because we talk about yards per route run a lot. So 2.31, that was better than Jamar Chase, Stephon Diggs, Devontae Adams, some guys like that. His A dot average depth of target was 14.1 yards. That was the 13th highest in the same range there with guys like Brandon Ayuk, DK Metcalf, Calvin Ridley, and Chris Olave. He did have seven drops. This is kind of a bad note here. He had 12 drops last season. So that's a lot. That was 19 drops over his last two seasons in Cleveland. That's not good. That is the one knock on Amari Cooper right now for being such a reliable guy. And you see it in him. When he drops a pass, man, it eats him to his core because that is not his game. So this is honestly is uncharacteristic of him, but 19 drops. Over the last two seasons, he only had 23 total drops his entire career before this. Six years before he came to Cleveland, 23 total drops over his career. Two years in Cleveland, he already has 19. So that's something hopefully will get cleaned up. And I think that has a lot to do with bouncing around between different quarterbacks, to be honest, because we talked about it with you know the Browns moving from 
PJ and DTR into Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco threw a much more catchable pass than the other two guys. And, you know, when you're catching passes from Jacoby Brissett and then Deshaun Watson, you got no chemistry with either of these guys when you start out. It's the first time with both of them. Come in this season, Deshaun Watson, then he goes down, then it's DTR, and then it's PJ, and then it's DTR, then he goes down, then it's Joe. Okay, there's a lot of different styles of quarterbacking coming your way. I think that has a lot to contribute to the high number of drops for Amari Cooper. And I'm not just making an excuse for Cooper. We saw, and we'll get to it, a high number of drops for Elijah Moore, uncharacteristic for his young career so far. A high number of drops for David Njoku. Obviously, he's had drop issues in the past, but we saw, there's a, you'll see when we get to the tight end show, but there's a heavy concentration on drops in those weeks when DTR and PJ Walker were playing specifically. So there was a problem there, and I think that's why you're seeing the number as it is here. So Amari Cooper lined up 78% of his routes out wide, 22% of his routes in the slot. So a great stat here. He had a 51.7 contested catch percentage. He caught 15 of 29 contested catch throws. That's awesome. You, you throw a 50-50 ball to him. He's coming down with it 50% of the time. That is a pretty good number. That I mean, that's obviously you want it to be as high as possible, but right around that 50% mark is pretty good. Uh, let's see. He had five total games with 100 yards or more. Plus, you know, that career record setting performance in Houston week 16. He had 15 targets, 11 catches, 265 yards and two touchdowns. I mean, that's just as a fan, that's just the kind of game that you hope you get the opportunity to witness at some point. And that's why it's a career uh, career best game and a record setting game for the Browns because they don't want to happen all the time. They don't happen very often whatsoever. I mean, Josh Gordon had the, what was it, 261, the Browns franchise record for a single game receiving yardage. And that's held since, I think that was 2012. Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but it's been a while. It has been a while since a receiver has popped off like that in a game for the Browns. So when you finally get to see one like this, you just sit back and enjoy the living crap out of it. Let's see, Amari... Cooper, where was I? So five games over 100 yards, and he also had games of 98 yards, so almost 100, 89 yards, close to 100, and 90, again, close to 100. So Amari Cooper, essentially, over half of his games were like right around that century mark or above. That is awesome for a number one wide receiver, and that's why his yardage total was so high this year. So these stats are coming from playerprofiler.com. Amari Cooper had a catchable target rate of 63.3%. His true catch rate was 88.9%. Okay, so Amari Cooper, you take you know his receptions, his targets, do the math. His actual catch rate was a 56.3% catch rate. But uh, player profiler is taking into account not all those targets were catchable. That's, you know, just because he's, you can't look at a a receiver and say, oh, he only caught 56% of his passes. Well, some of those passes probably weren't going to be caught by anybody. So the catchable target rate for Cooper, like I said, just 63.3%. His true catch rate was 88.9. So that means he's catching a lot of passes that he shouldn't be catching based on the catchable target rate. Very, very good for Amari Cooper. Overall, 39.4 of his, sorry, overall, 39.4% of his routes that he ran were classified as wins against his defender. He had a 28.2% win rate versus man coverage compared to 47.2 win rate versus zone. So Mari Cooper does perform better against zone coverage in terms of his route running and his win percentage, which makes sense because you think about, you're you're obviously, you're not going to win as many of your routes in man coverage as you are zone. Man coverage, you're one-on-one with a defender, a lot of times these NFL cornerbacks are very good. Zone coverage, and this is why it goes back to now NFL defenses are running more zone because it's easier to run your defense that way into what these quarterbacks nowadays are liking to do. And I can, I, I'll, I'll do an episode talking all about that kind of stuff, the defensive schemes and philosophies and things like that. But if you're a, a good rece- receiver, if you're good at running routes and getting open against zone coverage, you can beat it. And Amari Cooper does. He had a, let's see, target separation versus zone of 1.83 yards. Now, those are just his route running data points for man and zone. But 
as far as productivity against each. Amari Cooper against man coverage, 27 targets, 18 receptions, 202 yards, a 66.7% catch rate against zone, 81 targets, 49 receptions for 995 yards. Almost 1,000 of his 1,200 yards came against zone coverage, a 60.5% catch rate. That was the 995 yards, second most in the entire NFL against zone coverage. The only person ahead of him was Tyreek Hill. And I think Amari Cooper was one yard ahead of Amon Ross St. Brown. Those are like two stud receivers. And Amari Cooper was right smack dab in the middle of them. So in terms of production, Amari Cooper, pretty consistent in his production, whether it's man coverage or zone coverage that you're trying to put against him. So all in all, talking about Amari Cooper, dude is an elite wide receiver one. I don't care what anybody says. You know, Amari Cooper, he doesn't talk. He's not a diva. Like a lot of wide receivers, he doesn't throw his, you know, he doesn't have fits or temper tantrums. He doesn't throw his helmet. He's not yelling at his quarterback on the sideline. There's no sound bites or clips of any of that stuff. So he doesn't get the screen time, you know, the social media attention that a lot of these other crybaby wide receivers get. And that's okay. As a Cleveland Browns fan, I am definitely okay with that. Amari Cooper, in my opinion, dude is a man's man. He's the Nick Chubb. Hey, maybe that's why I'm wearing the jersey today. He is the Nick Chubb of the wide receiver position, and he is a top-end wide receiver in the NFL. He wins with route running. He makes unbelievable catches, and he is among the elite wide receivers against zone coverage. I just can't say enough good things about Amari Cooper. The Browns are very fortunate to have him, especially considering there's not a whole lot to talk about at this position after we're done with him. And according to Next Gen Stats, just one last note here. I thought this was pretty cool. Murray Cooper has the seventh least probable reception in all of 2023 when Joe Flacco's pass in that Houston game. On fourth down, he threw it to the sideline. Uh, it had a 13.8% chance of being completed. And Amari Cooper made the catch. So I thought that was pretty cool. Now... In terms of Amari Cooper's contract in 2024, he's got a cap hit of $23.8 million and a dead cap of $11.3 million. So theoretically, the Browns could cut or trade Amari Cooper after June 1st, and they could save $20 million against the cap. Now, that's not going to happen. I don't think any of that's going to happen at all. But I bring it up to highlight that you know, the potential $20 million in savings is pretty substantial. That's a big chunk of change right there. It's, that's high dollar. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that the Browns are hurting for cap space, but just like every NFL team, you have to navigate the cap and you just have to be cognizant of, of what you're doing with your money. And, you know, without a doubt, and I've talked about this before, Amari Cooper is definitely a restructure candidate this offseason. No, no question. The Browns can, according to over the cap, they can free up, uh, looks like $12.5 million in a restructure. And I fully expect that to happen. So I I don't I I don't know what to say about Amari. It doesn't really matter who the Browns sign in free agency, trade for draft in April. It doesn't matter. Amari Cooper will be the wide receiver one in Cleveland in 2024. You know, as he's just coming off of this career high in receiving yards in 2023. And I cannot wait to see what he does next season. This episode is presented by Omaha Steaks. Browns fans, the 50% off site wide sale is still happening over at omahasteaks.com slash dogs. Head over there today. Make sure you take advantage of this 50% off sale on everything on their website. Plus, go to that URL slash dogs and you'll get eight free steak burgers with your order. And then if you use promo code dogs when you check out, you get $30 off your order. This is a deal you cannot beat, especially with the, the price of meat and all food and just everything right now is sky high. It's just stupid. But this kind of sale, now this, this meat is the best stuff you guys can get. I'm telling you right now, I've been talking about it for years. The steaks are my absolute favorite. I love them. They, the burgers, the jumbo franks, brats, the chicken, the pork, uh, all the seafood. They've got the ready to eat meat meals, desserts. They even have wine and things like that. Just go to omahasteaks.com slash dogs, check out everything they have to offer and make sure that you use promo code dogs. When you check out, get $30 off your order. Plus get eight free burgers, omahasteaks.com slash dogs. Minimum order may apply. Okay. So we've got one more guy to really talk about and then we'll kind of just, you know, hit on the rest of these guys as we go. Elijah Moore, 
Five foot 10, 180 pounds. He's 23 years old. He'll turn 24 here in March. So this dude's still pretty, pretty young. He's a young player to already have three years of NFL experience under his belt. Elijah Moore was born in Sunrise, Florida, grew up in Fort Lauderdale, played college football at Ole Miss. He was an early second round pick, if you remember, number 34 overall in 2021 by the New York Jets. And then the Browns traded the 2023 second round pick last offseason, pick number 42 overall in return for Elijah Moore. And, of course, the Jets sent us, along with Elijah Moore, a third round pick. So another fleecing, honestly, by Andrew Barry in the trade. That's why I can't wait to see what he does this offseason. Uh, the Browns went out. They got a guy that they planned to start at wide receiver from day one, gave up a second round pick, but they made the Jets give them a third round pick on top of it. It was just absolutely brilliant by Andrew Barry. We then used that third round pick to draft Cedric Tillman. So essentially, Andrew Barry used pick 42 to acquire two wide receivers. Pretty, pretty cool. And the Jets, just if you're wondering, they used our second round pick then to select their center, Joe Tipman. So in case you were wondering. Now, stats wise for Elijah Moore, he did play in all 17 games. So availability was not a problem with Elijah, which if you watch the Browns this year, you know that there were injuries aplenty. And I think at wide receiver, we did stay pretty healthy, which was good. Very, very good. That helped a lot. Elijah Moore had 104 targets, 59 receptions, 640 yards, and just two touchdowns. So all except those two touchdowns were actually career highs for him. The 104 targets, the 59 receptions, the 640 yards were all the best of his three-year career. And this is... This is kind of a funny stat. He also had nine carries for a whopping 11 yards. Super inefficient with those jet sweep plays. Elijah Moore, Jerome Ford. We said all year they were kind of competing to see who could be the best lateral runner on the team. And uh, Jerome Ford actually won by default because Elijah Moore had a 20-yard backward run against the, the Baltimore Ravens the first time we played the Ravens when DTR started. So the Browns... And Kevin Stefanski, the play calling, the offense, they learned their lesson with Elijah Moore. Eight of those nine rushing attempts all came in the first five games. And that was it. After five games, they had seen enough. So they just completely stopped even trying to run the ball with him after that. Said, you know, we'll try it with Marquise Goodwin when he gets healthy. We ain't going to do it anymore with Elijah. So here's a stat that made me go, what? When I saw it. Elijah Moore had uh, 599 passing snaps this season. 269 of those were in the slot, 314 out wide. So he actually played out wide more than he played in the slot. That's, that, I guess, just coming away from the season without looking at the breakdown of the numbers, that was just not my takeaway. I, Elijah Moore's a slot receiver. That's what he is. That's what he did. But that is not what the Browns really used him primarily as at all. He... He was more used outside, so he was not isolated to that slot role like a lot of people might have thought, like I kind of assumed. The Browns were honestly, in my opinion, playing him out of position, but that was by necessity because who the hell else are we putting out wide? I mean, I guess it was DPJ for a minute, but then he was gone, and honestly, when he was here, he didn't do anything anyway. I got numbers on him in a second, but they had to use Elijah in different ways, and I think that's something they need to figure out this offseason. He, uh, like I mentioned with Amari Cooper, Elijah Moore did have five drops on the season. Player profiler information here, catchable target rate for Elijah, 65.4%. His catch rate was, this is similar to Amari, 56.7%. But his true catch rate on those catchable targets, 86.8%. So again, same deal with Amari Cooper, Elijah Moore. A lot of their targets just were not great, but they caught more passes based on these numbers, based on these stats. They caught more passes than they should have based on the catchability of those targets. If none of that makes any sense, I'm really sorry. I, I'm not sure I explained that real well. I don't know what to say. I'm sorry, but they did really good. I guess the, the key takeaway here is when these guys were getting targeted and they were being thrown passes that were good passes, they were coming down with the catch. And they were still able to make catches on passes that were deemed uncatchable in the first place. So good job by both of these guys. Elijah Moore ran 147 routes versus man. He ran 329 routes versus zone. That's going to be the differential 
on all wide receivers, honestly, because again, 70% zone is what you're seeing. He had a 25.8% win rate against man, 63.2% win rate against zone. So if we compare that to Amari Cooper, it's interesting. So the man rates, the, the win rates against man coverage for Amari, Elijah, pretty much the same. But if you look at the zone coverage, Amari Cooper's zone route win rate was 47%. Elijah Moore was 63. That is insane. So what this tells me, if you're looking for a bright spot, if you're looking for some positivity at the wide receiver position heading into 2024, if the Browns can find a legit outside weapon, a legit wide wide receiver threat on the opposite side of the field of Amari Cooper, and they can keep Elijah Moore strictly in the slot, where I think that is where I think the slot is where he excels, and Elijah Moore can just just work that intermediate area of the field against zone coverage. Man, he could have a much better 2024. He could have a career year. And that that for me is the optimistic side. That's the positive. Thinking, okay, we got to get somebody out opposite Amari to free up Elijah to do what he does best. His target target separation against zone was 2.7. Remember, Amari Cooper was 1.83. So almost an entire yard better than Amari Cooper against zone coverage. When Elijah Moore gets to operate in that intermediate area of the field in zone coverage, man, I'm telling you, this could be really, really good in 2024. We just got to get help at this position. In terms of production against the coverages, 13 receptions on 22 targets for 149 yards versus man, 59% catch rate, and 37 catches on 61 targets for 361 yards versus zone, a 60%, essentially the same catch rate against both coverages. So consistent. That's good to see. His A dot. This I I was not expecting to see this. Elijah Moore's A dot average depth of target was 11.4 yards, just 3 yards uh, lower than Amari Cooper. So it's not like Elijah, Elijah Moore was only getting targeted on the short throws exclusively. And you know, we just need to get him back in the slot and let him work cuz I think he can be a very good receiver. So I I do think of all the receivers we're going to talk about outside of Amari Cooper, of course, but for the Browns, the one with the most potential is Elijah Moore. Cooper and Moore had the same catch percentage against zone coverage. It just goes back to the high number of uncatchable targets they received. And a lot of that has to do with, like I mentioned with the drops, several games with PJ Walker and DTR at quarterback. Now let's look at the contract. Elijah Moore is in the final year of his rookie deal, $24 million cap hit. Sorry, 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 sorry. That is not what I meant to say. 2024 cap hit is not $24 million. His 2024 cap hit is just $3.1 million. So a super, super cheap, affordable option at the wide receiver position. This is, like I mentioned, a contract year for him. That could bode well for his production. You see, I, I've said this with Jed Wills. And there was somebody else I talked about in a contract year too. I can't remember who it was. But when these players get in these contract years, a lot of times... You see them have their career or best career season to that point. And we could see that with Elijah Moore this year. Again, it's all going to hinge, like everything, with the availability and the performance of Deshaun Watson. So wheels up for Elijah Moore. Hopefully they can just get him back into position, let him run where he is successful. And let's get a legit threat on the other side of Amari Cooper. All right, we're going to speed through the rest of these guys real quick. Cedric Tillman, six foot three, two fifteen, twenty three years old, will turn twenty four in April. He was an older prospect. He was a late declare coming out of college, so that's why he's a little older already. He was born in Las Vegas, Nevada. Played college at Tennessee. A third round pick, number seventy four overall by the Browns. Got that pick from the Jets, like I mentioned in twenty twenty three. Personally, I was very excited when the Browns drafted Cedric Tillman. If you remember in last year's draft class, Cedric Tillman was one of the only few X-type receivers, outside receivers in that entire draft class. There was primarily a bunch of smaller slot style receivers, that kind of thing. But Tillman possessed that big body, contested catch outside receiver profile that the Browns were really looking for. And we got him. And I was very, very happy that we did. You know, we, we talked about it. We figured he was locked in as the Donovan Peoples-Jones replacement. And that actually did come true. The Browns traded DPJ at the deadline, except Tillman didn't really replace DPJ's production on the field. And when, I, when I'm talking about DPJ's production on the field, I'm talking about 2022 because in 2023, DPJ only had eight catches for 97 yards in seven games. 
It was like he was just completely non-existent. I have no idea what was going on there, but that's why they felt free moving him because he didn't do anything on the field anyway. But in 2022, you know, DPJ had 61 catches for 839 yards. That was really, really nice for a six-round pick on the Browns. So hopefully Cedric Tillman can take a second-year leap and give us you know production. I'm not saying he's got to go out and put up 800 yards. Depending on who else we bring in, we could have more. We could have a, another great wide receiver on the team, Elijah Moore. But if he could just chip in, I don't know, four to 600, stay in that 500-yard range, something like that, that would be really awesome. We need, we need some sort of production out of a third-round pick at the wide receiver position. We just we have to get it. Uh, let's see. In his rookie season, Cedric Tillman had 44 targets, 21 catches for 224 yards, and no touchdowns. So not a whole lot to talk about with his rookie season in terms of stats. He did have some bright moments. You know, he made some nice strong hand catches. And there were times when he just looked like a grown man on the field. I remember he made that that block. I think it was against linebacker Kyle Van Noy in the Ravens game in Baltimore. Just completely laid him out. And it was on a pass play. Deshaun Watson was actually trying to pass. And I, I just remember Deshaun kind of stopped and looked like, oh, damn, dude. And then he continued on with the play, but he had to stop and admire what Cedric Tillman had just done. And it was really, really cool. And then, of course, we all know there were other moments where Tillman just, you know, kind of continued that trend of Brown's Wookiee, 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 rookie wide receivers having no freaking clue what they're doing. Uh, he was cutting off his route, stopping short. It got kind of ugly at times. And, and it, he just overall looked lost more times than not down the stretch. So that was unfortunate to see. They did move him around a lot. I just, I feel like maybe they were asking him to do more than what he was comfortable with right out of college. 58% of snaps out wide, 38% in the slot. But there's no denying. This dude is a physical guy and I think that he can continue to develop and be a nice receiving option for the Browns. And I'm saying that with my fingers crossed because we need him to be. But I do think he has that potential again my excitement for him coming out of college still exists and you know we'll see we'll see how year two goes for him but this will be year two of his his rookie deal a 1.3 million dollar cap hit so he's a, a cheap option at the wide receiver position probably just going to be a depth piece piece this year but let's see and let's hope for a second year leap out of Cedric Tillman and we'll move real quick into my biggest Biggest disappointment on the Browns right now, and that is David Bell. Six foot one, 212 pounds. He just turned 23 years old this past December. So he's a younger guy. Born in Indianapolis, Indiana. He played college at Purdue. And I did a whole episode. Go back and check it out if, you, if you're interested on uh, David Bell last offseason. I, I talked about him. I looked at his college profile production. The dude was elite at Purdue. Just there's no other way to say it. He dominated the Big Ten his entire college career. He, he started out elite as a freshman, and the dude never looked back. He was such a good wide receiver in college, and that's why his lack of development over two seasons in the NFL, man, has been super disappointing for me because I was, and I, I hate to sound repetitive with all, everything I just said about Tillman, but I was really excited when the Browns got David Bell. I thought, man, third round pick on David Bell? This dude tore up the Big Ten. Let, you know, wheels up. Let's go. Let's get him in here and see what he can do in the Browns offense. And dude just hasn't done shit yet. Uh, let's let's look at this. Um, well, first of all, he's third round pick, number 99 overall in 2022. His rookie season, 2022, 35 targets, 24 receptions, 214 yards. Who's that sound like? No touchdowns. Who's that sound like? That sounds like Cedric Tillman. 24 receptions, 214 yards. What did I just say that Tillman had this year? Uh, 21 for 224. So essentially the same, essentially the same rookie seasons, uh, statistically speaking. Year two in 2023 for David Bell. His receptions dropped down just 14. His yards dropped down just 167. He did have three touchdowns. Two of those came in the week 18 game against the Bengals with Jeff Driscoll late in the game. 68 of those 167 total yards this season came in that bye week finale in Cincinnati. So, his production, usage, everything dropped. In 2022, he played 72% of the snaps in the slot. In 2023, he only played 46% in the slot. His overall snaps, just in general, were essentially cut in half in year two from his rookie season. I don't know what's going on with David Bell, but we, we saw this trend, unfortunately, with Demetric Felton, where as a rookie, 
from his rookie season to his second season to his third, the usage, his snap counts, everything just dropped. It just plummeted each year, dropped. So essentially, he was becoming a healthy and active each each week. And that's what I'm fearful with David Bell in 2024, that we're looking at a guy who could start end up being a healthy and active week in and week out, depending on roster needs and positional needs and things like that each week. But if that's the case, if that starts happening, David Bell's getting cut at the end of 2024. That's what's going to happen if if this trend continues. Now, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but just based on past experience and history with other players, the way the Brown, I mean, if the Browns are already limiting your snaps, that is just not a good sign. You want to see snap counts go up as a player develops and grows in the league. You want to see, it's a receiver, right? You want to see his targets go up. Hopefully he has more yards in year two than year th- and everything just went down. So not, not looking good for David Bell right now. He's going into three year or year three, I'm sorry, of his rookie deal, $1.4 million cap hit. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens, but kind of the same situation with these other guys. It depends on what the Browns want to do in free agency at this position, if they want to trade for anybody at this position, and they're going to draft at least one wide receiver for sure in the draft. So there might not be room this year for David, but I don't know what's going to happen. I, I think he's on the team in 2024. I think he he plays out his third year and we'll see how it goes. But if we see another dip in production or things stay pretty low like they did in 2023, I don't see any way he's on this team past 2024. And that's pretty much it for wide receivers. Uh, Cooper, Moore, Tillman, Bell. That's kind of your wide receiver group right now under contract for the Browns. There's a couple other names to talk about. On the reserve non-football injury list is Michael Woods the second, six foot one, two oh four, twenty-three, about to turn twenty-four years old. He's from Magnolia, Texas, played college at Oklahoma. Sixth round pick, number two oh two by the Browns in twenty twenty two. And his career stats, five catches for forty five yards in twenty twenty two. That's it for this guy. He ruptured his Achilles last April, missed the entire twenty twenty three season. Uh, you know, if you follow these sports injuries closely for any other teams and players, Achilles injuries are kind of like the death sentence for skill players. You look at uh, running backs like James Robinson, Cam Akers are some of the most recent names to suffer these Achilles injuries. And yes, you can recover from them. You can return, but these guys are just never quite the same. So Michael Woods being a six round pick to begin with, and we don't really know what he was going to be able to do in the NFL anyway. And then you throw the Achilles injury on top of it. I, I don't think it's very likely he's on the team in 24. And then we can talk about Jalen Darden has a reserves futures deal. We'll see what happens with him. Jakeem Grant uh, signed that three-year deal with the Browns a couple years ago. Dude just keeps getting injured before this season. He's he's never played a regular season snap for the Browns in two years. 2022 tours Achilles. There's another Achilles in practice. 2023 came back but ruptured his patellar tendon in a preseason game before the, the year started. I think Jakeem Grant, he's most likely getting cut. Uh, he's 31, 32 years old this season. I, I doubt he's back in 2024. This team is starving for wide receiver help. The only other guys on the team in 23 are now free agents. You're looking at Marquise Goodwin. He's going to be 34 years old, dealt with blood clots and his own injury you know, stuff. And he's probably not coming back. He had just four catches for 67 yards total in 2023. Sucks for Marquise Goodwin. We got to meet his mom. I got to kind of chat with her at training camp over the summer last year. And talking to her and hearing how excited Marquise Goodwin was and the family in general for him to be in Cleveland, to have this opportunity to play with Deshaun Watson. They, they were really excited. So anybody who says, oh, Deshaun Watson, people don't want to come play with Deshaun Watson. It's total bogus. I mean, we talked to somebody who said, yeah, he's excited to come play with Deshaun Watson. Like, this is this is exciting for him. And, you know, it just never, never came to fruition. We heard Stump Mitchell in his interview after he was fired talk about how the chemistry between Deshaun Watson and Marquise Goodwin in the preseason and over camp and stuff was just so good. And it, he was bummed that we never got to see it play out on the field. Just a shame. Uh, but I just, I don't know if, we see any more of Goodwin. Then you got James, a guy like James Prochet the second, and no catches for the Browns as a wide receiver. But he did return twenty two punts for one hundred ninety seven yards, nine yards per return. So I thought James Prochet did pretty well in the return game. We'll see if the Browns want to explore bringing him back in any capacity. 
And that's it, guys. That is that is your wide receiver grouping for 2024 at the moment under contract. It's not good. It, it is not a good list of, of players. And that is not meant as a, you know, as an insult to guys like Cedric Tillman or Elijah Moore or David Bell, but it's just the reality of the situation. You cannot have a high profile passing attack in the modern day NFL and expect anything super awesome out of it when you're only, you got one legit wide receiver and that's it. You have to have other guys. And yes, I know we have David, uh, David and Joku. I know. And we'll get to tight ends on the next episode, but you got to have wide receiver guys. You just have to. I do think Elijah Moore has potential and I think he can become something really, really nice for the Browns, but we have to get another player or two to help on the outsides with Amari Cooper. So that'll be the Browns main focus. I'm sure this off season, that's why we talked already. We did an episode talking about potentially trading for Brandon and Ayuk. He could be available. I would expect Andrew Barry to start at the top. I would expect him to look across the league, everything. What are, who are players that other teams might be willing to move on from? Who are players that could be cut candidates based on salary cap and age and all that kind of stuff? Who are the best available free agents? Who are the best guys coming out in the draft? And I expect him to start at the top of the list, the best players on that list, and then work his way down from there. So we'll see what happens. But man, do we need help. So that's uh, that's my breakdown on the wide receivers. And like I said, next episode will be the tight ends and then we are almost done with state of the browns guys we have to wrap it up with the quarterback position and we'll get to all of that soon but until we do again like i always tell you guys like the video on youtube subscribe hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of the new stuff coming out we've got episodes dropping like damn near every day now it seems like video shorts clips dog bites all that kind of stuff so there's always something fresh coming out of the dogs podcast. If you're listening on audio, thank you very much. If you're on Apple podcast specifically, I would love if you would please leave us a five-star written review. Just scroll down to the bottom of the podcast app on our page while you're listening to this, hit five-star review, rate the show, and then just drop some sort of comment in there. Just, hey, hey guys, love the show. Great Browns content, good analysis, funny conversations, whatever you want to say. I don't, it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't really matter. Just, Giving us a written five-star review on Apple really helps us in the rankings and helps get the podcast in front of more Browns fans like yourself. So with all that being said, appreciate everybody. Love you guys. Best audience in the freaking world. And that's because we root for the Cleveland gosh darn Browns. And I'm so excited for 2024. We'll be back with tight ends on the next one until I talk to you guys again. Let's go Browns. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Dogs Podcast. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at The Dogs Podcast. Get your thoughts on the show at thedogspodcast.com.